thanks everyone for tuning in to our next installment of our Learn from the Expert video series. Today, I'm talking with Cheng Peng, who has been on the platform for quite a while and has done some really cool contributions. So Cheng, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Thomas. How's it going? Very good, thanks. Uh, so I'd like to start by just hearing about your background and how you came to the platform. Cool. So I'm primarily a software engineer. I did a lot of technology through the last uh, five years or so. Um, I first discovered Quantopian about three years ago because I was trying to understand finance and really manage my own portfolio. And through that process, I decided that, well, I think I should better learn directly from data. So that's something I'm more comfortable with. Um, and unfortunately, you know, at first when I tried to do it, I tried to build my own backpacks and I tried to do all those things myself. And I realized that's just not practical. Um, and thankfully, Quantopian exists and it was perfect, right? So I got a chance of actually using this, the technology, getting all the data there. Um, and my ride's been there ever since, right? So now I've, and I've picked up everything ever since. I found it a lot more interesting than I would have ever thought. So yeah, that's kind of how I discovered Quantopian and kind of, um, you know, how I got here today. That's really interesting. So you're saying you started out just software engineering with uh, a remote interest in finance and then sort of spiraled from there. And did any of the resources on the platform help you with the economic theory and those types of things? Oh, yeah, it was amazing. The tutorials, the learning and, you know, the resources, the community, all these things added up and like helped me understand like what I, knowing what I don't know, I think is really important. Um, or at least like you know, unknown unknowns, right? So at least at least I know what I don't know. Um, so that kind of helped me to really like put everything in perspective. And ever since I've been hooked, and like you know, it was like at first I was just like, hey, I'll just build this, you know, risk parity thing for my own personal retirement. And then afterwards, I was like, well, it's, it's not that simple. Nothing is that simple. So, so yeah, that that seems to be the common learning experience. Yeah. So what is your research process? Say you want to participate in one of the challenges and you just, I guess you start out with some idea, like where's that idea coming from? And then how do you go from inception to implementation and actual uh, submitting it? Right, so the first thing I usually do is I look at the data set itself and try to get intuition about a data set. Uh, I think it's really important to understand what data you're working with. Otherwise you have in a place where you just trying random stuff and you're just, you know, hoping you get some signal that that works, but that generally doesn't work out very well if you understand what you're looking at. Usually once I get some intuition about a data set, I think of a few factors that can capture the information in the data set. So for whether it's momentum or estimates or anything, you know, any type of, of data set, you can think about what factors make the most sense, right? Stuff like how do I normalize it? You know, what kind of uh, time series of length is more appropriate, st stuff like that, right? And usually after that step, then do something called a factor optimization, uh, which is kind of like creating with all these different kinds of signals, kind of come together, combine them into a final signal that I can try in sample, out of sample as well. And that's sort of like a very general way to put it and how I would like first approach it. Interesting. And any like hard lessons, insights that you learned in like being on the platform, things where you wished you could have known them sooner? Yeah, 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 two things, I think. One is like every strategy has to make sense, right? Finding something that works is not the hard part. It's actually knowing why it works, that's the hard part. And, you know, without knowing that, the minute you try to trade that, the minute you run that live, the minute you use that, you'll realize very quickly when it stops working that you don't know why. And usually in those cases, you're in a really bad spot, right? And not, not understanding how this is working, how this algo works, which or putting a really, really odd situation where you're like, do I turn it off, do I turn it on? So I think that's like one thing that's really important. The other thing is like understanding the process of like statistical significance. So if you have like five events over the last year, that's not very significant, right? So you can't, you're not really confident in something like that. So really understanding that and being sure that you want to minimize, you know, false positives or overfitting as much as possible. I think I would say those are two of these points. Yeah, those seem like really important lessons and also something that has been echoed by many of the other experts uh, before. So yeah, the economic intuition, otherwise overfitting is just too easy to, to happen once you start tweaking individual things. Yeah. Uh, so then, so you say you come from a software engineering background, what type of particular edge or skill set do you feel is most 
helpful in, in your workflow and providing you with the edge to generate something that has alpha? Right, right. I think um, my visa edge is to be able to automate my ideas very quickly and be able to do that in a fashion that represents kind of um, my ideas, you know, in an efficient way. And I think the other benefit is I'm also very open to learn and look at things with a different perspective. So understand the economics part of it, understanding you know, how data science works, learning the basis of data science, you know, and then using those two ideas, be able to write tooling around how to optimize certain things. So that way, when you know, go and test this idea, let's say I'm testing a trend following idea, I'm able to let's say, generate multiple different kinds of trends, plot them and see how they do historically, understand how they uh, work given some sort of time series. And it, it's really being able to really iterate very quickly on that, and I think it's my edge. Yeah, interesting. And that seems to be also what Kyle, who also comes from what technical background talked about in his workflow in terms of like just iterating very quickly on various ones. So um, I think I'm really excited now to see the tutorial based on taking that one step further and really trying to automatically optimize and squeeze more alpha out of individual ones. So uh, yeah, feel free to like show us, um, show us your tutorial. Cool, yeah. So let me share my screen. So today I'll be focusing on something called factor optimization. Um, and really it's as simple as understanding once you have a particular factor, it becomes really difficult to optimize it. I've found that something that to be common across everything I've done, right? So let's say you have a estimates factor and then it works pretty well. And the question is, well, how do I make it better without, you know, implicitly making it more of a fit, making it worse. Right. So, and it can really be difficult to say, oh, well, because of course, when you start getting good things, you start over justifying, you know, things that you've done and you say, oh, well, this makes sense. But then you realize how much sense does it actually make? And it becomes a really hard thing to do. So I was hoping I could talk more about it and kind of explain how I do it, at least. Um, and one method to really, you know, without having to, you know, going too deep into finding, finding tweaking your numbers to actually develop something that kind of works pretty well. So the general idea of this is, you know, you start with a factor and you create different versions of it. And then throughout all these versions, you try to look at how correlated they are with each other, you cluster them, and then you pick out the ones that are at least correlated that are so significant. Um, and then finally, you end up with this new combined signal that you can test. So that's a mouthful, but we'll go through one by one, step by step, so we're very clear on kind of exactly you know, what, I'm, what I was trying to say. All right, so I'll start with the first step. The first step is pretty straightforward. You do imports, you create a pipeline. This is no news to anybody. Um, and, you know, just carry on. So the first step, though, is, as I said earlier, is to create many variations of the original factor. So I call these base factors. And the idea is to create a lot of factors that might be out of scope for our imagination, or at least systematically. So it's not something that we have to worry about uh, in depth. I believe the factor I use should be a veterans factor. Um, this is the estimates, you know, up minus down. Basically captures the number of estimates going upwards versus downwards. So I think we're familiar with the factors works pretty well. And today the goal is to say, well, what, what would I do to try to come up with a better combination of this uh, idea? Uh, hopefully, you know, that works very good out of sample and in sample. Right, so this is uh, the factor that veteran also presented in his uh, learn from the experts video, right? Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So basically, the idea is here we start with something that has already a strong economic rationale, maybe you already vetted it somehow. And now you just want to see if you can improve on that original idea that you know works, but just to squeeze out additional alpha. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's all this is for. Cool. And this is a core factor, basically, what you'll work with mostly. And the other factors I have here are actually variations of that factor. So something called I call C diff, which is basically, you know, another way to calculate returns divided by standard deviation. So kind of like a Z score, time series Z score. Uh, CS SMA, which is like a moving average. C vol, which is like the volatility of the core factor. And you'll see from this that these are all different like, you know, transformations of the core factor itself. And finally, this is really important, I think, Kyle mentioned it too, which is or everyone Basically, everyone mentioned it, which is the fill NANs is really important, right? Uh, you don't want to end up in a spot where you have a lot of uh, NANs. You don't want to actually remove all that or at least convert that to numbers. 
So these are our base factors. And the next step is really to use these factors in a way to actually create them um, in, in combinations where you get new insights. So that's the next step I would call um, producing layered factors essentially. So you can see here, this would be an example of what I mean. You would take the input of maybe CSMA uh, as you know factor of C vol. So essentially, you imagine what it means is well, at first you're smoothing the data, and then you're saying what's the volatility of the smooth data, right? And that's only one way of looking at it. And you could do this, and you know, surprisingly, with only three different base factors, you can create many combinations, right? And I'll, I won't be going through all of them in in deep deep depth, but I'll kind of give you an idea of like what I mean. So here's the base factor. Here's this nice little function that I wrote. Basically what it does is given some list of factors, it will create lots of combinations of them and then you know, fill the NANs and gives you a bunch of information. So um, we'll go through this, but essentially after you run it, you see here, well, you have you know, C diff, which is basically on C diff, you know, this itself. Here is C diff with another C diff, so like a return of return, which is kind of like almost a derivative um, and you know, so on. Right? And this has about 12 in total. So here you see we've done you know, 12 different unique transformations on the core factor itself. And it, it's very possible that we'll get some very different insights from these factors. And these base factors, as you call them, or factor transformations, would you reuse them for another uh, like initial economic factor that you're inputting? And like, is that just a very common thing and you would just flip it up? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it really depends. Um, I think for more economic factors, it's more about understanding, well, you, you want to smooth it and you want to use some of these factors to a point where you want to get your, your core factor in a good spot. And these are just like in, addition, in addition to just that, right? You know, moving, giving your differences, more returns, more moving averages. I, I, I'm sure with the more economic factors, it's more based off of like um, the reasoning rather than just like basic transformations like this. Right. Right, and the next step I would say after you finally get all this is like, well, well, what do I do all this stuff, right? You can't just say, oh, I'll just use all this and I'll go and just run it. I mean, you could do that, but honestly, that's very that's not ideal and that defeats the purpose of this whole process. It's really the concept of scoring and ranking these factors. So you have these 12 guys um, and, the, and the point is, well, you have to pick out the best ones, you have to pick out which ones are correlated and all stuff like that, right? So the first step is to score it and to rank them. So the reality is like most of these factors are probably gonna be useless, all these 12, um, maybe only a few will be useful, but the idea is um, you wanna pick out the ones that are going to be useful. So I create two other functions here. One is called the uh, generate factor stats, essentially um, with the results from a pipeline, what the price is, what the factor is, you'll be able to get um, information, the adjusted information coefficient as well as the historical return performance. So this is kind of like, you know, pulling direct from alpha lens um, particular you know, function in alpha lens that gives you the ability to grab that information. And this guy here, the second function here, um, is to get factor key stats, uh, get factor stats by year. Essentially, given a bunch of factors in a universe, uh, this will actually go through different time periods and give you the, and use the function above, give you the information coefficient uh, in different you know, regions of the year. So for here, for example, here, it's from 06 to 09, 09 to uh, 12, you know, 2012, 2015. And I think it's really important to make this, make this a fact where I'm actually testing three different regimes rather than the whole time period once, right? I think that's an important distinction to make because by doing this, then suddenly you have you know, more data and more data for, you know, the, the fact that you're working with in different kind of regimes. So that's essentially what this is doing. That's cool. So yeah, for the universe, just Q tradable stocks, US, QT universe works well. I run this guy uh, with three different years and you know, you see it's running all the, you know, all the, all the different data here. Uh, and, and this notebook takes a while to run. So if you're gonna run this, keep in mind, you might wanna run it and just step back for like, you know, a few hours, maybe less, depends on, you know, how the service feel. Uh, and the results to play this. Essentially, for every year, you have a list, a dictionary rather, of the factor, as well as the adjusted information coefficient over the last three uh, regimes, as well as historical returns. And, and the reason you want historical returns is that it'll be used for calculating um, the correlations later. 
but for now it's just you know if you don't worry don't worry much about that what we're looking at is really uh this field here so finally the ranking right so you have all these factors and the answer scores you know associated with them um the goal is to look at well what is the the top three the bottom three and get a very you know broad feel to what these factors really mean and what this does is, is rank factors as well you take a list of factor stats that you've gotten above and it will go through all of them it will look at um they'll sort them look at the best ones the worst ones um and I actually added an extra layer of of uh, risk adjusted uh factors here because you think about it it's uh, there's only well i think here there's only one but you know in some cases you want multiple um and here uh after running it you see the best three factors the worst three factors right and i guess what i want to represent here is to see you know how these factors do over time as well as what are all the values you know like more intuition to this type of ranking so one thing you want to do just like you're doing economic into understanding this just like you're building economic intuition for sort of factor signal you want to still build the intuition for um, the process or the modeling or the factor ranking that you're building. Otherwise, you also end up in a really bad spot where uh, you don't really know what you're doing. And an example of like the way you look at the data is, well, let's say, let me look at, you know, all the factor scores that I've already created and how they look like. And you can tell very obviously on this histogram bucket, you have stuff on the left, stuff on the right. Obviously with more, you know, um, base factors, you'll have a better uh, histogram distribution. But from what you can see is, oh, well, well, yeah, you can see there's something here, negative one, which is like, you know, very, very negative. There's something here, like two, which is very positive. It gives you an idea of like what your, you know, score is going to look like on average. And that's just help you understand that, you know, some, it's not too skewed to the right or to the left and that your know, transformation actually makes sense. Otherwise, you end up with everything to one side and, you know, what's the point in doing what you're doing at all? I see. So this is a sanity check that your transformations are still retaining some sort of normal distribution. Uh, exactly. Or you're actually trying different, you know, um, different different uh, combinations that gives you something that's more unique than just you know one one type of like the original factor itself. I see. Um, and that is on the best factor that you chose, or what are we looking at? Oh, that's on all the factors. So this was supposed to be about twelve. And you can see there's buckets, there's about 12. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so yeah, after having that, after ranking them too, um, it's time to actually analyze factor results, right? So the importance of doing this is just to build more intuition to make sure what you're doing makes sense. So what we've done is here is we've taken the top factor, the bottom factor, what the most positive, most negative factor. Um, and the goal is to run it throughout this analyst sample. So you'll notice in the above, I've tried back testing or rather running health lens through from 06 to 2015. That means everything from 2015 onwards has not been seen. Um, the goal is obviously to make sure that everything we do here makes sense. So uh, based on this histogram, it looks like, you know, whatever's on the most, you know, most positive side will work very well, or whatever's on the most negative will also work very well. Um, and really it's just another sanity check to make sure that you know, what we're doing makes sense. The ranking is correct. Everything makes sense, right? Um, so this basically just runs alpha lens given some custom factor, uh, also pretty straightforward, nothing crazy here, and creates a full tear sheet. So you'll see I'm taking the best factor, um, which is the moving average of moving average. Um, I don't know why that is, but this is the best factor that, you know, from all the combination ones we tried. And you'll see that, um, need no surprise, there's some alpha, um, this actually looks, looks kind of funky, unfortunately. The bottom, the bottom quantile looks kind of weird. Um, the graph looks kind of bad, too. You see there's a huge dip midway, unfortunately. Um, but one thing I do want to look at, though, those are just like performance numbers, is, you know, the T-stats and just, um, adjusted information coefficients. This is actually not bad, right? Having something over three, over four uh, is actually a good sign, right? P dot is at zero. Obviously, this, you know, these statistics are kind of like... Um, are dangerous we don't understand them but it's a, it's a good sign to know that um this is somewhat you know uh, pretty significant uh and the question is well how does this do out of sample uh similarly look at this and the alpha looks okay not great it's kind of negative here unfortunately uh, this how did you uh do, how did you split the out of sample here oh right right so the in sample here is um from 20, 2006 to 2015, which is essentially, so previously I've tested 
you know, three different buckets. So now the goal is to test the whole series from 2006 to 2015. And add a sample essentially from 2015 and 2019. So you'll see in here, um, this is from 2015 and 2019, which is the next four years. I see, okay. So, um, so you would use this for selecting the best factor. And then once you have it based on the in-sample data, you test that very last one um, that you might want to deploy on the out of sample and see if it holds up there as well. Exactly. And this is, a, again, this is still a sanity check. We haven't done any combination stuff. This is for saying, well, does the best factor in my bucket do the best and the worst factor? Right. And that's really the question I'm trying to answer. Uh, but, you know, digging into it, it's just good to go through this process just to understand kind of, um, you know, what things I look for in this alpha lens stair sheet. So, yeah, unfortunately, this doesn't look very good either. It looks kind of weird. Um, it's positive, but not not by much. Uh, one thing I do like about that is the fifth quantile is a lot larger than the first quantile here. Um, but overall, not great. And you see here in IT stats, also not great. So you ask, well, haven't we just failed at this point? We've done all this work. We found the most the best factor, and suddenly the performance looks terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, go ahead. Uh, no, 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 yeah, I was just... Uh... Agreeing with that question coming okay. up. Right. Uh, but that's not the case. And it'll be very obvious later is because factors aren't ne aren't necessarily very correlated. And some factors might just do terrible in a certain regime. So you don't want to throw it away. You, know, you just say, okay, let's move on. We'll, we'll look at it later. Uh, and this is the worst factor. This is the worst factor. So the, the exact opposite of what we had before. Uh, and this guy actually the, looks like it, it doesn't do too well, but it's also because it's, it's negative. Remember, this is the worst factor. So actually, this does pretty well because it's completely negative. And this looks very good, right? The first quantile is very positive. The fifth quantile is very negative. So the worst yeah. factor looks great. And oh, look, the equity curve looks great as well on both ends, wow. right? Yeah. Right. So, you know, excellent. T stats. It's actually worse than what you had above, which is surprising to me. But hey, still significant. Still pretty well. OK, that's a good sign. Well, how does it do out of the sample? How does the worst factor do out of the sample? And it's it's still you know not not ideal, but it, it's still negative, right? Yeah. It's not positive; it's negative. Um, but you know it looks okay. You know um, it goes downwards. You know you know it looks not bad at all, right? So I would say this is a a, a good like you know a good example of something that has worked. Um, but that just gives you an idea of like okay, well the best the best factor and the worst factor are miles away, right? and that's the reality. They are miles away. That's something I want. To Make sure that okay, my rank, my factor ranking process has worked correctly. I so see. yeah, this based is on the in, based on the out of sample. Now you want to basically track whether the ranking in the out of sample m roughly matches the ranking of the in sample. Correct, exactly right. So this gives me a confidence that the factor ranking, factor scoring process that I build actually makes some sense, at the very least, right? So now. Now what? Well, there's still 12 factors we have. We still want to combine them in some way. Um, and we don't want to do it blindly. Uh, we do have scores, which is useful, but that's not going to be um, what, we, what we're going to use to actually you know, score it because you get very correlated factors, right? So the goal here is to do actually factor clustering. And the idea is, well, if something, something's overlap, we only want to use it once, not you know, twice. Otherwise, you have a signal that's very skewed to a certain factor and not, you know, not evenly divided among multiple and it's pretty important to do this step because without the step then it becomes um you do a lot of factor discovery and then all these variations don't get captured and then you kind of end up in a spot where you're just better off using the original factor anyway um so these are very, very similar functions we had before get all factor stats essentially runs a pipeline um and then generates all the factor stats for the whole period right and we have to do that because uh, if you remember earlier we actually grab the historical returns of each factor. That's really useful because with that historical return, we could actually, you know, calculate correlations. The second my function here um, basically creates, you know, basically grabs the information from the alpha lens statistics and basically looks at combined returns. And those are basically the returns that we're looking at. Uh, well, let's give it a go, right? So run all the factor stats, it runs all this stuff, you know, we get the factor, a data frame, we're running all this. So these are actually all the historical returns of the factors. Now that it's there. Uh, and now we can use that to calculate correlations. So there's different ways of calculating correlations. I decided to go with a simple one, which is saying, you know, default DF correlation. I think we use this Pearson. 
Uh, it's not not the best, but it still you know still works. Still gives an idea of kind of how these factors are correlated. And this function here is just plotting essentially with given a data frame, plotting all the correlations out, really. Uh, and, and, and BF uh, contains the returns, right? So you're computing the correlations in return space. That is correct. These are actually returns. So cool. you're calculating in return space. Yeah. So here, nice little graph. We've plotted it. We have our 12 factors on one side, 12 factors on the other side. And you can see there's around one, two, three, maybe four buckets of you know correlated you know uh, sections that we can use. Um, and it essentially gives an idea of like, okay, well, if we pick a factor from one of these you know clusters, we would never pick another factor in the same cluster. Um, and gives you an idea of kind of like what you know what what the factor combinations is very likely going to look like. So that's cool, uh, but the question is kind of like, well, how should we go about actually doing that? Because there's, because you can manually look at these, just pick one out, which you know probably would work fine, or you can rank these again by the scores we had earlier, which is what I'm going to be doing. So after understanding the relationship between each factor, we really want to make you know kind of the most optimal decision in the combination step, and really. There's a few kind of filtering things you want to do. So I think with these factors, we're fine. There's only about 12. But imagine if you had like 200, right? Then there's no way you can do it manually. So given my background, I want to, you know, be much more focused on the automation. Um, and that means, you know, understanding kind of like, okay, well, if I had 200 factors without actually picking it out, how would I do this? And one way to do it is you can sort everything by the rank first, by absolute rank, right? Whether it's most negative or most positive, whatever the absolute rank is. And then you go down the list. So essentially you're taking the most significant one you have from the sample, and then you are you know, comparing that with any new factor you get you know, from the list. And for any new factor you get, you know, the ideal way is you want to make sure that it's not correlated with anything you currently have. So it sounds very manual, but the process is y'all, if you go through a ranking, you see something good, you pick it up, you check the next, next one on the list. If it's similar, you throw it out. If it's not similar and it's significant, you add it in and you just go through this whole process. And I wrote a function for doing that, I believe, um, somewhere down here. So this actually just sorts it, nothing crazy. Right, here we go. Get uncorrelated factor combination. That's what this is doing. So this function here, get uncorrelated factor combination, it basically takes a correlation matrix of the returns, um, as well as the rank factors from you know most absolute to least absolute uh, significance. And essentially, I'll go through all of it, and as it goes through all the, from the highest to the lowest ranking factors, it will screen out all the ones that are basically already correlated to the basket. Otherwise, let's keep adding to it. So at the end of the day, when you go through all the rank factors, you'll end up with a basket of factors that are all um, fairly uncorrelated with each other. And this process, you know, I've seen action, once you call the method, we get the final factors. These are, these, look like, these are the three that we're gonna be using. So in this step, what I wanna do is I wanna take these three factors and I wanna see well how they do and kind of actually use them later down the line. So one thing I wanna throw out there is, I inherently already done this, but this actually takes the most absolute factors um, that, are, that are essentially, you know, at least correlated with each other. So. We're actually lucky, all these factors end up being positive. So we look at C diff, um, that one is over here is actually positive. We look at CSMA, SMA, um, that one's actually also positive. Oh, you know, it's, that's the wrong one. But uh, yeah, it's still positive. So normally for the ones that are negative, that if we've used it, I would actually put the sign like here, for example, um, because essentially, then you know, the most negatively significant factor is also a factor that we can use in our signal combination. I want to make sure we have the right signs in the right places. I think we're lucky in this case, we don't have to worry about that. But um, now that we have this, um, we can use this factor dictionary to actually do some of the combination um, down, down here. I see. So one of the earlier ones that you showed it, like the worst one, which was consistently negative, had negative alpha in sample and out of sample, uh, you would because you're taking the absolute when you rank them, that it would it might score pretty high, and then you just have to remember here to actually flip the fact, invert the factor to to get to that. Um, so you could basically treat the inversion as just another uh, 
transformation that you're doing here. That makes sense. It, it, exactly, exactly. And then, you know, that way you've captured all, as much, as much of the signal as possible. And you actually notice that it doesn't exist here. And the reason for that is it, it was actually captured in one of these factors, clearly. Otherwise, it would already be there. So one of these factors is doing the exact same thing as the worst factor we saw above. I, yeah, I see. And finally, we're in the last step, the combination step. So this is a step where now that we do all this work, we know all the signals we have, we have to actually create one signal. Because at the end of the day, we're trading on one signal, not three. Um, and the way I've done it is actually really straightforward. I do nothing crazy. You know, it's really simple. All I do is I create another pipeline with factors in the universe. And the goal here is to, you know, um, fill all the NANDs that exist for each factor and then just literally add them. Literally just add all these Z scores together. N nothing crazy. There's definitely a better way to do this, but, you know, for demonstration purposes, I think this was good enough. Uh, and after finally adding all these Z scores, you want to do a Z score one more time and Windsorize it. And um, part of the reason for that is it's just a good, a good process to, when you combine multiple factors, you might get some really, really heavy numbers on both ends of the tails and top and bottom. So I found it'd be really useful to just Windsorize that a little bit just to give you a bit more of a smoothing. Otherwise, you know, you end up trying to allocate your whole portfolio to like two names. So um, this worked out pretty well for me. Yeah. So in this case, it's probably fine just as a minor um, nitpick. I think you often want to Windsorize before you z-score, but um, it probably doesn't make a difference here. Uh, yes. Yes. It, that makes sense. Um, and oh, this just runs the alpha lines. So, okay, cool. So you run a final factor, you have a dictionary, you have a universe, you run through all the you know combined pipelines. And now the final moment, this is the final moment of knowing whether or not all our work meant anything. Right. If, if these results look bad, we've kind of like, unfortunately, we need we'll need to go back and reconsider everything we just did. All right, I'm excited. Okay, so this is in sample. In sample is the easy part. All right, in sample, alpha looks great, great quantiles. Love this. Wow, and I mean, even in sample is kind of interesting because uh, before, like the individual one that we looked at, didn't look nearly as good as this one. Exactly, but you can see some characteristics, right? If you remember, the individual, the individual was doing this stuff, you know, it did yeah. very well and it fell off. But now, when you see when it falls off, it doesn't actually, you know, go to zero. It actually slows down. So it's interesting. Think they look at that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the diversification benefit, which of course is being helped by the way you took the correlations into account, so it helps smooth that out. Exactly. Exactly. And if you scroll down here, you know, TV stats are great. Uh, risk wow. adjusted IC, great. Um, it has been negatively skewed, but you know I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, this looks, you know, I think so far in sample it has worked. Right? The question is, well, out of sample, does it work out of sample? And this is a question I ask myself every day, right? It's like, does it work? And it does. That's the thing that I was really proud of. Like after all this work, you realize that, you know, the alpha looks great, right? The quantiles still look great, excellent. Wow. Right, and you look at these, you look at these numbers. You know, the graph looks excellent, equity curve, no problem. Right, it's just beautiful. And then yeah. if you scroll down, you look at T stats, relatively similar. That's that's very hard to do. From my experience, every time I test out a sample, I get something like zero here. You know, it's like, it's like right. you know, you discover this process where you always get, out, you always end up with something really terrible out of sample because you overfitted in sample or or you done didn't make any sense. So this is a really good sign. These are all good signs, right? But the one thing I want to say, right, we're not, we're not, it's not, it's not over yet. The one thing you always want to do after every single thing is test the benchmark. And it's really important to test the benchmark because if you don't have the benchmark, then you don't know what any difference you made. You, maybe you did absolutely nothing, right? And so and with the benchmark, bench do you mean the original factor or? Exactly. And, and the benchmark could be anything. It could be the original factor. It could be something else you're testing against. Um, but the point is, you have a benchmark of saying, well, did I improve, right? Right. And that's sort of the, the importance of the step, because otherwise you, you end up in a spot where you don't really know actually how much you improve. And sometimes you might end up doing better with just the original factor, honestly. Sometimes that's the case, right? Sure. So this is the original factor. Okay, the original factor looks pretty good, right? But as you can see, the performance graph isn't, right? It has the same characteristic where it does very poorly in 2009, 2010. Interesting, yeah. Right, the quantile is still good, obviously. Um, but yeah, you still see that little dip. That's not very good. Um, statistic wise, T stats are great. Risk risk IC is still great. 
Um, but, you'll, but you'll notice that like, for some reason, giving all these summary statistics, although they look good, the equity curve doesn't look great. Well, it's just because they're two different things, right? Being, being significant in terms of predicting returns on average over time is different than saying the total equity curve over time. Those are actually two different concepts. So that gives the idea of like the more factors, the better. And actually, out, out of sample, um, this actually held held up pretty well out of sample by itself. So I was it was actually very tough to beat this factor because a lot of factors just, just you know fall apart out of sample. This one actually does very well in sample and out of sample. So kudos to veteran for that. Um, but you know, end of the day, right? Um, this looks good, and the statistics are slightly you know are still pretty. It still holds up really well. So you can say for a fact that well, this is a good factor, but I think we beat it. I think we beat it. I think I think we made it better. Yes. And right. the other thing which is really helpful here, I think, is uh, that you that you still see very similar characteristics from the original factor to the final one, which is the combined one. And I think that's important because you probably don't want to have something that looks completely different from before, right? You want something that is similar but improved upon it. So just to uh, smooth out the, the weak parts of it. So that is exactly what it looks like if done here. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Overall, this process, I was happy with. I think this is something that you know, this is part of the edge that you know I have when I do this um, factor combination, factor optimization. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so basically, the workflow you showed us is starting with a factor that we have some economic rationale on, and then you create all these different versions, and not just say a, a moving average of one, but then that moving average, you could also feed into yet another layer of transformation. So there's transformations of transformations and the framework is very flexible in terms of the kind of combinations that you're doing. And you could even extend it pretty easily, I guess, to just add more of those transformations as you go along. And what I really liked is that it takes the existing factor and it we did see that it doesn't completely change it, but rather creates different versions with different characteristics that are still reminiscent of the original one. And then you take those, have a way of combining them that are in a way that is most diversifying, which makes us assume that you, it has the highest effect in smoothing out the deficiencies of individual ones. And then even like individual transformations weren't all that powerful, the final result definitely beat the, the previous one. And it has like in sample, out of sample testing built in. So we have this protection against the fact that it's not really uh, overfitting. So that's, um, yeah, that's a really interesting way of taking existing factors and smoothing them out and uh, and just improving something that we expect already to have alpha. Is that an apt summary? Yeah, no, I think that covers exactly what I was, you know, what the process looks like and, and all those, you know, bells and whistles that would go into kind of um, the small things that people, you know, might not necessarily notice. Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, so what do you think is like the most critical piece of, of that workflow that people should be aware of when they use this? Uh, it's very dangerous. It's a double-edged blade if you're not aware of how you're using it. Um, you'll see through every step of the process, I've done so many sanity checks. I've always questioned, you know, every step, every transformation I've done, every step throughout the process, when you do the clustering, when you do uh, the, the you know, factor optimization, the ranking, everything there. It's always a sanity check because if there isn't, you end up in a spot where you don't really know suddenly what you're doing anymore. So I think one of the key insights with this tool is to really understand, you know, step by step what has changed, what are you doing, what has happened. Otherwise, you end up in a spot where you're no better than just overfitting manually, you're overfitting automatically. Both are bad. So right. Yeah. Uh well, thanks. Thanks so much for sharing those insights with us. And uh yeah, hope you're staying. Uh, safe and healthy out there. Exactly. I hope everyone else is too. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks. Bye.